always loved to watch this guy swing it. And now he's become my favorite Twitter, or is it X follow? He's Michael Kim, and it's vacation time from the PGA Tour for Michael, but he's joining us. Hey, thanks for joining us, Michael. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. I'm uh, happy to be here. Uh, are you tweeting prolifically since I've last looked at Twitter, or are you just chilling right now? I try to get one a day out. Um, there's been a lot of stuff about the rollback, too. So uh, just, uh, you know, putting my thoughts out here, here and there, and uh, a little bit of golf advice as well. Well, your thoughts are wise, tremendously wise and super helpful. And fans, we on YouTube if you want to watch this. Um, if you want to go follow Michael Kim, it is worthwhile. I'm not joking about being my favorite follow. But Michael, before we get to a few of your tweets and some of the advice golf-wise you shared, I want to take you back some, and and I sort of want to introduce you to our global audience. You know, you're a PGA Tour winner, but a lot of folks don't might not know who you are. So tell us about growing up in Southern Cal, going to college, being a stud, and how you came to where you are, please. Yeah, I was uh, born in Korea. I uh, moved over to San Diego area when I was seven years old. Um, picked up golf about a year later. How? Um, How'd you get into golf? My, my dad, I think, saw it on TV or something. And, and you know, it was year 2000 when, when, I, when we really started golf. So it kind of aligned perfectly with, with Tiger. And um, uh, yeah. Hey, I want to interrupt and, because you reference your Korean background. I watch all Korean golfers, and I remember back in the day some, because I was teaching golf full-time here in Georgia, and we fought more, was Fort Benning. Lots of Korean people come there, and their parents would bring the kids for lessons. I've never seen a more disciplined um, group of folks like ever. And I say to so many young aspirant golfers, I'm like, look, the girls are dominating. The guys are coming through. What is it about the culture? You just got just so disciplined about everything you do. I think it's just hard work is kind of that it's, it's almost expected. It's not even, it's not even like a, it's, a, it's just a given. Um, you see guys on the, on the range and there's certainly a lot of South Korean golfers um, grinding it out. Um, and, you know, certain for better or worse, certain parents can be a bit pushy, which helps some, but hurts others. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of, I think it's just the culture. It just hard work is expected and it's, you're not there to kind of just willy waggle and just kind of have fun almost. Or you are there to have fun in part, but you're certainly there to, to try and get better. I feel like um, it's just separated too. And, and, you know, in the era of golf being popular, whatever sport you play, um, now talent is one thing, but the hard work is what separates people. Wouldn't you say? hundred percent. You know, I, I was kind of thinking about this the other day where a lot of people like to differentiate the talent and the hard work where you know, it's at the end of the day, it's just a total package of, yeah. you know, having that, that discipline and having that work ethic is, is, you know, a part of the talent. I feel like where you have the will and the desire, it doesn't matter how talented you are. I've seen plenty of talented guys that, you know, hit it really far or hit it pretty solid, but if they don't have the, the work ethic, it's, it's all meaningless. So naturally you had yours, your good young junior golfer in the Southern California area. And that gets you to Cal, Cal Berkeley. Um, and you had a prolific career too. They highlight by the senior year where you're the national college player of the year, win the Jack Nicholas and the Fred Haskins award. Um, as you look back, cause a lot, we got a lot of fans that are like aspirin collegians too what advice would you give them? Because you've taken it to the highest level in college golf. I think what was really nice um, when I first, it ended up being kind of like a perfect storm for me where, where I knew I was good enough to start. I think that's really important to not, to not um, kind of be on the bench the entire time. But also I certainly wasn't clearing away the best player. I was one of the better players, but you know, I went in there, uh, with Max Homa. Um, he, he was a couple years older than me. Yeah. Um, Max was on the team. Michael Weaver was on the team. Brandon Hagee was on the team. That's good. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a, we had a, we ended up having a really good team and, you know, we just fed off each, of each other. We were really competitive. Um, I had a bunch of, you know, little short game contest games on the short game area. And, 
we really competed every day. And I felt like that was a huge, huge benefit to uh, my success, but also the team success. We just fed off of each other and, and, you know, kind of going back to that hard work, it was pretty noticeable for me from the beginning that um, the top five guys were the, the top five guys that were spending the most time on the practice facility practicing mm -hmm. um, the other guys, certain guys were, were a part of the team, but you know, they were there more for academics and that is obviously totally fine. Um, but you know, the, the hour spent was certainly noticeable, the, uh, the difference of hours. Hey, um, I'm a, a long time believer in the fact that, you know, necessity is kind of like the mother of invention a and playing with golfers better than you. Like you talk about, you come in and Max is ahead of you. And, and, and that almost like it gets you uncomfortable and gets you playing in a place where you might not have been there, there yet, but you'll find a way. So would you recommend to the golfer Naturally, working on the game is important, but I'm sure just competition and playing was very important back then, huh? Hundred um, percent, and not not just competing on your home home course. Hopefully, you're able to play different courses, different conditions. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I traveled to North Carolina. I was from San Diego, so I'd never played in Bermuda grass before, uh -huh. and that was was like the most mind blowing thing. Like. <laughs> you know, I had never dealt with flyers. I had never dealt with, you know, those Bermuda rough lies or, or grain. And I remember finishing, I think I almost finished that last in that tournament. But, um, you know, you have to kind of go through those ups and downs of tournament golf and, and playing in different conditions um, to to really get yourself better and uh, a better golfer, really. Yeah. So 2013, you're the first Cal golfer to win Jack Nicholas and the Haskins Award. You turn pro in the end of the year. Get on the web.com then, now Corn Ferry Tour. A couple seasons, uh, you have a few good finishes, and next thing you're on the PGA Tour. <laughs> Talk about that graduation because, you know, a lot of young professionals are like, wow, I'm going to make it to the tour. But it's not seamless, right? There, there's, there's things to be learned en route there, correct? 100%. You know, um, <clears throat> my, my Q school didn't go you know it went well but it wasn't perfect i i was i think back then top 45 got you a tour card i want to say a, a corn fairy tour card um but i i was dealing with a lot of like swing issues and um the it was still six rounds back then and after the fourth round i was in i want to say 12th or 15th place i was i was well within the the cushion but then, you know, when, when, you know, those nerves and anxiety kind of creep in and they, they kind of bring out all the bad swing issues that you've been trying to hide and kind of put in a corner, they come out and I finished, you know, one or I finished two shots outside the, outside the, the 45th cut line. And, you know, that it's tough, you know, conditional status on corn fairy tour is, is better than nothing for sure, but it's still, tough to get into the tournaments and, um, and the reshuffle. Um, luckily, you know, because of my collegiate career, I was able to get a couple exemptions early, which, which ended up being huge. Mm -hmm. And um, I missed my tour card by uh, I think one birdie on the final hole. I had like a 15 footer that I think that might've um, got me my card. Um, but, you know, I used it as motivation for the year after I knew I was going to have a full year to play with instead of kind of in and out like the first year. And, um, you know, was able to, to, um, use that and get my tour card that, that second year. Hey, look, nerves are one thing. Uh, there's to, to me, I, I say oftentimes when I get to follow you guys on tour, I'm like just weekends on CBS, we see, we see it different because we have the guys playing well and there's nerves when you're contending for an event. But there's the nerves on a Friday afternoon trying to battle the cutter, a different thing. And then the, the Q school back in the day nerves. I mean, that's a different thing, huh? Definitely. Um, <laughs> you're not even playing to win at Q school, which is kind of weird. You're just trying to get within a certain threshold of, you know, <laughs> it was 45th then. It, and it's, it's weird. You feel like you're protecting a lead starting from day one. You just like trying not to screw it up. And and it's such a long week. Like it's fixed tournament rounds. It's, it's usually three or four practice rounds before that. 
and you're thinking about it the entire week and it's, it's draining. It's, uh, it's only four rounds, I think now. Um, but it's, it's just a long week. It's a stressful week. Everyone's you're you're really disappointed or you're really relieved afterwards. It's crazy, isn't it? Because it's amazing how, because now Michael Kim gets on tour, uh, just freaking goes bananas and blitzes the field in 2018 and wins the John Deere. I mean, I was on the call there. I had a group in front of you and we were not even on the show because it was like the Michael Kim show. Um, and I think of that. And then I think of a situation where like you're playing so free and stuff's coming easy. But then it's the same Michael Kim then the the following season, you, you start to struggle with the game. And it's amazing how golf takes you through these emotions up and down and in and out. And it happens in the blink of an eye sometimes. Yeah. You know, even, you know, that, that season in 2018, I was having a pretty poor season leading up to the John Deere. And it was to the point that I had to, I felt the need to change coaches. I, I changed coaches from the guy that, Help me get to Cal, help me get my tour card. You know, I've been my longtime junior coach in James O. And, you know, that was a pretty tough decision for me, mm -hmm. uh, but felt necessary and changed coaches to John Tillery uh, mm -hmm. three or four weeks before the deer. And, you know, all of a sudden I catch lightning in a bottle and I win by eight. And, um, one and you're, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you just kind of assume like, this is it. This is kind of my, this is kind of my trampoline. This is, I'm going to use this to, you know, move on, win more tournaments, you know, contend in majors and, and, and all that. But, you know, it, it just, it just kind of came crashing down on me, to be honest. Um, I played well the week after at the British open. I, and then from that point on, it was just a, a pretty steep downhill, downhill slide. Um, we tried, to make meaningful changes, kind of big whole wholesale changes mm -hmm. into my golf swing, which ended up not really working out. And then, and then I, and then I kind of kept looking around at different spots, tried a lot of different things just, and really just dug the hole deeper and deeper mm -hmm. um, until, until, until 2022, I guess, a couple years ago, uh, I went back to the Corn Ferry Tour and kind of picked my picked myself and picked my game back up. Let's talk about getting out of that hole because you have the win, you've got the two-year exemption. Uh, and oftentimes I've sort of seen this where you, 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 book the, you, you book the job for a couple of years. So the golfer almost gets the mandate to go, okay, I got some cash in the bank. I got a little time to work. And then you want to address areas that you feel like need addressing. Then you start working. And I've had golfers, you know, back when I was teaching elites full time, almost say to me when they've come to me, because you're looking around all the time, right? And they're like, you know, I feel like I've lost my identity. I'm not even sure who I, who I am as a player. Um, that's a horrid space to be. Uh, I want you to talk about that. So I'm not saying you might have, but I feel like where you were missing the lion's share of the cuts, that sort of stuff happens quickly. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 you know, it all comes from a good, good space, right? You're trying to make big changes. You're not looking for that band aid. You're trying to make real, real meaningful change for, for the long term. And, you know, it just, for whatever reason, it, it, it didn't work out for me. And you are just kind of searching, you're just searching and you're, you're almost looking for that kind of one week to click mm -hmm. and it, it never does. And, and, you know, the problem, the real problem I had for me was, you know, on the range, I, you, I was hitting it fine. Okay. Um, and if you showed up on a Tuesday morning and saw me hit, hit balls on the range, you'd be like, oh, that guy's, that guy's hitting it, hitting it totally fine. And then I'd go to the tournament and certain nerves would creep in and certain bad habits would creep in and, you know, when you get nervous or and and a little bit of anxiety in, um, you know, those old patterns and the new patterns, they if they don't if Fine. you're not they <laughs> collide and they they create a little bit of havoc in your swing and your body doesn't really know which one to which one to go to. Um and what the problem was that I couldn't I started losing trust in my practice because yeah. when I was practicing everything was was fine and dandy. But whenever I would go to tournaments, it would 
it would, you know, it would be, it would turn pretty bad. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that, that was a, a thing that I had to really grapple with was like, you know, what's the point of practicing hard when it's not showing up at all on the tournament range or yeah. on the tournament course? Yeah, I get you. I, I want to ask you too about kind of the time management because look, all the golfers listening to this, even the club golfers, you know, the, the, you know, you work on the game and the swings in a bit of a tangle. And then the next thing you're working on your swing nonstop and the other areas of the game, the scoring stuff get neglected. And then that hole that you were talking about, it starts to almost dig itself deeper. 100%. You know, you can, on the PGA Tour, I feel like with a really good short game and putting, you can you can make putts. You're, prob- you're not going to contend yeah. probably, but, you know, you can scrap it around and you can make cuts. But, you know, I was so focused on that, on the full swing that I, I stopped paying much attention to the chipping and putting. And, you know, I, I, it's hard, it's hard to focus on the chipping and putting when you're putting for par for from 12, 15 feet every time Um, you gotta get a handle on, on the, on the, on the ball striking first, which is, you know, why people and I certainly kind of go along that road. But like you said, it only makes the hole deeper and, you know, through the, through the slumps and the humps, I felt like I started practicing a bit better as I, as I figured out what was good for me and what wasn't um, certainly wasn't, I certainly wasn't going to get out of the hole, just beating golf balls on the range. Cause I, I certainly tried that for a while. Um, and, and that, and that block practice where you just kind of grinding away on the range and for hours or hours. And that, that really wasn't going to do it for me. So um, I, I, changed how I practiced a lot, um, changed how I thought about the game a lot. And, you know, and this helped me kind of on the rebound. And, and last year was one of my best seasons ever and hope to, um, keep, keep going on that, on that path. Well, yeah, the Michael Kim I've seen, um, here in 2023 and beyond, uh, it looks like you've got a real handle almost to maturity about it. Um, what was the tipping point? Was there like a watershed where you're like, all right, I'm going to change the practice. I believe you hooked up with Sean Foley too. Um, that would obviously have some, uh, some influence, but, but was there a moment where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. I, I'm not, I'm going to change the way I'm approaching it. I think that was kind of a, uh, there was no one big moment. Um, there was a lot of little changes here and there kind of tweaking the, the practice sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, you know, change. Oh, yeah, changing to or going to see Sean was it was a really big moment of change for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to him when I was probably um, in my career at my lowest. I had just lost my all my eligibility on the PGA Tour. I had one year of Corn Ferry Tour status. <laughs> Excuse me, um, left, and you know, for better or worse. I was like, you know, what, whatever you need me to do, I am open yeah, to it because yeah. everything I had been doing wasn't working. I was like, you know, you could tell me to swing like Jim Furyk and I was going to do it. Um, it, it wasn't going to matter. Right. And, um, <laughs> and John, you know, obviously didn't, didn't say that, but um, he's like, all right, let's, let's, let's see what we have. And, and it was, it was a fairly, smoother transition than than what i had what i had um in the past because we kind of went back to some of my older junior golf swings and my you know he he calls it your your swing dna where you know if you if you go too far away from how you grew up swinging it 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 can be problematic and so you know we went kind of back to my junior golf swings we we certainly changed it a little bit here and there and put some, I would say like modern techniques into it. Um, but you know, that's kind of how we went. And, um, I think that's why the transition was, was a lot, was a lot smoother for me. From afar, uh, this is the golf teacher in me coming out, uh, from afar, when I've seen you on the range, I've not had the luxury yet. Um, this is coming soon, um, of calling you on the course, but, but from afar, it almost looks to me like, you less handcuffed by technique and you more creating shots. Am I crazy in this? Because you, you look liberated when you swing the club to me right now. 
It's um, I'm not well. Yes and no. I've I've I'm certainly not searching for anything anymore. I am pretty pretty clear on on what I what I want to do, what I have to do, um, and that comes with uh, me knowing exactly the ball flight I'm going to hit on ninety five percent of shots with the right. which is my draw. Mm-hmm. Um, I spent like a year and a half to two years trying to work in a fade because that's what everyone <laughs> everyone told me that that's the straighter shot and that's kind of the the uh-huh. shot that I need to play. But you know, I had growing up playing a draw. I was a short hitter growing up, and so I had kind of been hitting a lot of draws to kind of get that little extra distance here and there. And I think it, it comes a lot more natural to me. Um, and so, kind of a funny story at. Uh, one of the first tournaments um, I played was the was the Safeway Open. I Monday qualified, and Sean wasn't there, but you know I was talking to him, and I had we had talked about you know I'm hitting pretty big draws for a PGA Tour player, like 10, 15 yard draws with right. a lot of my clubs. Mm-hmm. And on on I get to the PGA Tour, and kind of these old habits kind of pop up, and I'm you know not really confident in this in these fling draws and that I'm hitting, and so I call Sean on like a Wednesday. I was like, you know, I I think I'm gonna go back to a little fade because uh, that's what I had been working on for like two for the last two years. And he goes, okay, okay. Um, he, he goes, you gotta play with what you what you're comfortable with at at, at tournament mm-hmm. uh, in tournaments, and I played terrible just god awful i finished mm-hmm. almost dead last and i think sean colt sean called me on friday he goes look michael he goes i don't want you to hit a hit a fade for for a, a full year he goes unless you're behind a tree don't hit a fade for a full year and i said i got it i got it no problem and uh the since then thing, i the funny thing I've, is uh, the silverado north loves the draw i've lost so many holes turn from right to left at that place yeah yeah, nine nine is a good draw. Um, I think I think that first hole was, um, you know, for me it's like that first start was so important and like, uh-huh. you know, the first just because the first hole doesn't set up for for a draw, I I I must have gotten caught up with uh, with the fade or something. Yeah, that's true. That's a really cool story. Um, so now you're back on track. Um. If you had to sort of give advice to the listener, because look, the reality about golf is all the elite golfers to me are like one swing or one swing thought ish away from playing well and or playing badly. All us mortal golfers, we're spending more time hitting the ball, not as well as what we do when we hit it well. So for the folks who are battling to kind of find it again, could you kind of package something and go, here's my gift to you and my experiences that as I look back on it, this is what you can go ahead and this is the mindset to adopt. I think, you know, for one, I think you can't go too wrong with just at least getting a full turn in your backswing. Uh Um, It's too amateurs get to pick up with their hands and arms. And because, you know, your hands are the only one connecting you to the club. Mm-hmm. They get a little too caught up with, with the hands and rightfully so, but you know, at the end of the day, it's still a pretty big body motion that you're doing. It's like a, it's more, if you think like of a pitch where it's like a full turn and then kind of the, the pitch is happening, the throw is happening kind of the last, last bit. Oh. Mm-hmm. And um, at least if you get a full turn, I think you have a better chance at it. Um, and I would say at least when you get on the range, I would hope that you have a specific thing you are there for and not just, and not just there to randomly hit balls, unless, you know, unless you just kind of want some time off and you just want to kind of think about something else other than work or something like that. So at least get a full turn and, and hopefully on the range you have exactly a purpose you're there for okay for the folks on audio i flipped the screen i'm sharing the screen now with michael and i'm showing him his twitter feed which is one of my favorites so if you want to see this go to youtube and search and subscribe to mark immelman and then you can see these tweets now i've picked five michael um and i'm going to go through them and these are all pretty recent and i'm dating this it's um in late december 2023 but man before we go here it's like all of a sudden Michael Kim's shown up 
and you bringing golf wisdom. I'm you, uh, you <laughs> sing this stuff. And it's like, you're such a giver. And I'm like, God bless this man. Because you know, most PGA tour pros are keeping the stuff close to the vest because they've got the secret, but, but you just so open and sharing this. What was the inspiration, man? I think um, a part of it was, um, I keep going back to that Safeway open or the Safeway <laughs> open. Uh -huh. um, but uh, last year I played with Max Homa and Max to me is, is a, is a dear friend. He's a guy that I grew up playing a lot of junior golf and obviously a lot of college golf together. And to me, he's just, he's just Max. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But then I go to Safeway and for whatever reason, Max and I, our careers never, never like matched up to where when he was playing well and when I was playing well, it seemed like when he was playing well, I was playing bad. And mm -hmm. when I was playing well, he was playing bad. Mm -hmm. And so it was one of the first few times where, where I played, you know, a PGA tour round with him. And just, I remember being really surprised at, at the following that he had at Safeway. Um, I was part of like the feature group with, with um, Max and Cam Champ, mm -hmm. who's obviously very popular there. Um, but, you know, seeing the, the reach he had from, from Twitter was eye opening. And, you know, I remember thinking to myself, well, if I want to, if I want to start, tweeting again or you know really making this a focus I, I don't want to be the the everyday like you know those everyday posts you see from pros like here excited to Boring play stuff. the yeah here excited <laughs> to play the Wyndham championship and they post a picture of the Wyndham championship or or, or yeah. swing like I, I, I definitely didn't want to do that like you know if you're going to do this you you certainly want to kind of differentiate yourself from others and and what and I kind of thought like what would I have and and you know through the through the ups and downs that I've had or, and mostly the downs mm -hmm. I had seen a lot of coaches and I've seen a lot of um, different theories and ideologies about golf and I was able to kind of pick their brains off and I felt like I had kind of amassed a decent amount of knowledge and and kind of figure out what has worked for me and I and I felt like it could help others as well and so you know maybe that could be my lane of, of um, trying to give golfers, amateurs out there a little bit of help and also, um, and also some, you know, cool stories that I've picked up along the way. So mm. that's kind of, that's kind of been my content, I guess you can say. Folks, he's at Mike underscore Kim 714 on X to be correct. His posts are fantastic. Right. You're a real giver. This stuff is kind of golf. Um, golf game improvement centric a lot of your stuff is i almost call it like michael's diaries because it's like all of a sudden you come out with this thing i'm like dang i'm so glad he said that and, and so for all of our on the mark folks go check him out because it's a treasure trove of golf information and i'll kick it off here we're going to talk about rotation putting anxiousness um change and then you did a nice post on the long swing and this is just folks we're scratching the uh the, the, the tip of everything Here's the post. I'll read it and just let you comment. I think I think some of you think rotating your body in the downswing closes the club or helps release the club. Rotating your chest and hips is an opener, you say. Jumping with your lead leg earlier, rotating, releasing your hands more earlier, or staying back with your head is a closer. If you're hitting it right and trying to rotate more in the downswing, you are not helping yourself out. And when I saw this, I was like, Choirs of angels for each brother, because I find so many golfers, they open social media, they find some tip and they see some PGA pro talking about rotation. And then everyone jumps on the bandwagon. There's early extension wrist, you know, all this sort of stuff. And I see club golfers turning open, turning open. And as right hand as they are littering the right side of the golf course. So please elaborate on your observation there. You know, like you said, like there's a lot of, you know, there's so much, I'm sure, I'm sure you're very aware, 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 but so there's a lot of trends in the golf swing, right? There's a lot of trends. Uh -huh. And I think the trend these days is the, is the bowed left wrist and mm -hmm. kind of the, the very Victor Hovland, like where you're holding mm -hmm. off with your, with your body, you're rotating hard. Mm -hmm. And I, I got caught up in that trend for, for about a year trying to get the, the closed club face, trying to 
quote unquote, like take your hands out of it and yeah. really let the rotation of the club, a rotation of the of the body kind of, you know, hold the club face square. And really, you know, I see so many people struggle, struggle with slices and that, you know, that's generally coming, you're going, coming out path and with a super open club face and, you know, rot- rotating your body more is only, is not, it's not helping that sentiment at all. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I took a lot of lessons with George Gankus okay. and he's all about rotation, but his, the biggest thing with him is you have to get really good turn on the backswing. I feel like too many people are focusing on the turn on the downswing, mm-hmm. but without, if you don't get good turn on the, on the backswing, the, the downswing, it, it doesn't, it makes, you know, you have no chance from there. So, um, and so, you know, you, for guys that are missing it, right. Trying to rotate it more on the downswing is, is, is a recipe for disaster. I'm so glad you would say that because it's easy to get locked up in trends because, you know, there's always something sexy. Me as a golf teacher who's been around teaching golf since 1996, I'll sometimes open something up and I'm like, that is sexy as heck. And then I'm like, but wait a second, I might be trying something that I cannot do. And yeah, your voice of experience almost is like tweeting about it. 100%. Like, you know, Victor Hovland is an incredible ball striker and an incredible golfer. But if you look at kind of the old, if you look at the Hall of Fame of golfers in totality, there's he he is almost a one of one, or he is maybe in like the one percent that swing it like him. Mm-hmm. So many more swing it with kind of the neutral wrist and kind of a good full release of a club, and way way more. There's way more of those. You know, Victor Hovland might be more of a a. Um, in baseball, maybe like a sidearm thrower where, you know, just because he throws it so great that way doesn't mean you should teach everyone else to throw it that way. Amen, brother. Okay. uh, If you're watching, I scrolled past Michael's thoughts on uh, the golf ball rollback and other things. (laughs) And we've gotten to one year um, and it's about putting. And look, as an on-course announcer, I've oftentimes said that you know, he'd like to try and leave himself under the hole here, you know, if it's a really, you know, devilish looking putt. And you tweet here, you go, trying to leave yourself an uphill putt is a bad move no matter if you're hitting an approach or chipping. Strokes gain shows us, distance is king. And in that, just trying to get it as close as possible is the best strategy. A tough three footer has a higher make percentage than an easy five footer. I'd like you to elaborate there because you do it at the highest of pressure. Um, and those three and five footers, I mean, those things keep rounds alive. No matter whether you're a PGA Tour winner like Michael Kim or a club golfer who plays to a 20 handicap. Yeah, you know, I, I, I like putting up tweeting stats or golf stats because you know, they're stats. There's no bias in that. You know, certainly with, with certain swing stuff, it might help some, but it might hurt others. But stats is stats to me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, putting, it's it's pretty simple. Like, distance is the most important part in, in your putts where the shorter the putt, it's no matter if it's a downhill slider or an uphill straight putt, distance is the, is the most important factor when it comes to your make, make probability. And I feel like, we can get caught up, especially um, if you're around the greens of like, oh, maybe if I leave myself in that area of the green where I might have an easier putt, but oftentimes we're not good enough to actually put it on that spot and trying Mm -hmm. to get it to that spot, we might put ourselves further away from the hole, which is not, not ideal. And, you know, Ideally, you just try and get it as close as possible and 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 go from there. Tremendous. Um, you referenced this earlier in our conversation, and this was a tweet about it. Um, and you talk about nerves or anxiousness. And I've got it on the screen here, you tweet, I've hit shots great when I was anxious. I've hit terrible shots when I was anxious. 
I've hit great shots feeling confident. I've hit terrible shots feeling confident. There's no need to freak out about a negative thought that might pop up before or during your swing. The bigger your reaction to it, the longer it'll stay in your mind. Your thoughts are your thoughts. Your thoughts about your thoughts matter a whole lot. Try to accept and move on. I mean, th this is, it sounds trite and sort of simple, but this is almost the thing that unlocks all the other things. Right. You know, I've, um, over this last, over this last year, I've worked with a mental coach and I've, I've learned a lot more about the mental game. Mm -hmm. Um, in years past, I thought your mental game was, you know, just don't get mad on the golf course and try to keep even keel. Mm -hmm. And that, that was kind of most of it, but you know, that is certainly a part of it, but so much of so much more than that. There's so much more than that where it's, it's about, you know, like I said, the, uh, like I said on the tweet, your thoughts about your thoughts matter in the sense that if you, you know, everyone has a negative thought on the golf course, your brain, if, if the shot really matters to you and there's consequence to the shot, mm -hmm. your brain, it's more designed to survive than it is to thrive in that yeah. it's going to automatically go to worst case scenarios. If, if it's an important shot to you, let's say you're on the last hole, you have a one shot lead and you're in your member guest, and there's water down the right. And <laughs> automatically the first and most, you know, blaring noise you will hear or the thought you'll see is, Oh no, don't hit water. it into the water. Yeah, exactly. Don't hit into the water. Right. Uh -huh. And you might be able to kind of keep that away for a little bit, but as you get closer to the ball, as you're about to swing that, you know, that, that noise is going to get stronger and stronger. And what I, what I did but learned trying and trying not to do is it's like, Oh no, that reaction of like, Oh no, I can't be having this thought. It's that's, I, uh, you know, I shouldn't be having this thought that's almost the worst way to think about it. It's, you know, the better way to think about it is, you know, it, it's, it's natural to have this thought mm -hmm. and then, and then try and refocus on, all right, but what am I actually trying to do? And that is to hit your shot in, into the left, into the fairway or, or whatnot. And, but, you know, your reaction to those negative thoughts creeping is a real, is really important. Yeah, I, I do want to ask you a follow-up to that. Let's say water down the right, uh, you get there and you're like, oh, shucks, don't hit in the water. Um, for Michael Kim, and I'm doing this for advice for the listener, um, I think the tendency with most folks is to aim more left. Does Michael Kim go, all right, I'm going to trust my draw here. I'm just going to make sure that that face is closing or not pointing at said water through contact. Is it is it as simple as that? I certainly don't aim like left edge of the fairway because my misses are more left, if anything. Um yeah. If it's my last hole of the day, I have a decent sense of of how my swing is feeling for for that day, yeah. and I'm sure I have hit shots with my driver where I was not feeling a hundred percent confident, where I'm not just swinging freely, and I kind of use that as database of how I'm going to hit this shot. Yeah. If, for example, you know, in a hole prior. I've aimed it at the right edge of the fairway and just made sure I turned it over as really hard. Mm -hmm. And that has worked that I had worked really well. I very well might aim it at the right edge of the fairway on the edge line of the water and just try to release the heck out of it. That's such a cool observation, which brings me to the first tee shot, you know, because the, the, the data, and I use that in air quotes that you have is maybe your last few swings in the driving range. Is it a similar sort of thing there for that first tee ball? Because that first tee shot makes even, you know, makes all amateurs nervous. And I'm sure you guys get jacked up for the first tee shot as well. hundred percent. Um, you know, we, we, uh, at least I have a plan for each tee shot. Um, mm. that might, that plan might change based on how I feel my swing is doing, but, um, I, whatever that first tee shot it is, I'll, before I go to the tee, I'll hit a few trying to feel, trying to hit whatever shot I'm going to hit on that first tee. 
Yeah. And that's generally what I go with unless unless the conditions are so different that um if it starts raining all of a sudden I might have to change clubs, but that's pretty rare. You know, I'll ask my caddy um what what the wind is doing on the first hole, um, what our plan is and that and certainly get a couple reps of what I want to do on that first tee. Lovely. Okay, two more. Um, this one is sweet. It has a picture of a really cool-looking backswing with you. Look at that torque and the rotation and a club shaft nice and short of parallel. And then you got John Daly from back in the day on the right side of you with the John Daly backswing. And your um, observation was, and I read, most of you have, in air quotes, too long of a backswing. Turn less to keep it near parallel, which is the reaction. In actuality, you have too long of a swing because of your wrist cock, not from turning too much. I think if you have too long of a swing, try to really limit wrist cock and keep your body turn, if not turn more. I have a very big turn, but my club never gets past parallel. Notice when my hands are compared to John, not a big difference, but his wrist cock is making his swing longer. There are certain benefits to this, but the negatives far outweigh the positives in my opinion. There's a lot we can mine here. And I, and I want your take, please. This is like, this is, I am tweeting this, but Sean Foley might as well have tweeted this. Because <laughs> okay. uh, he, he's, uh, a lot of my uh, current swing beliefs are because of Sean. And so, you know, so a lot using of his... the, are you using the pro sender? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly a part of it. Uh, okay. You know, this is right up Sean's alley where we, he and I both, don't like a ton of wrist cock you get you certainly get a few more miles per hour because you you load the wrist better yeah. but at the end of the day we feel like um that's that those are just more angles that we have to deal with um as we get closer to impact mm -hmm. um so you know he and i like a big turn and if you kind of can see the the picture of the backswing, I certainly get a massive turn. Yeah, your hands uh, are behind the, your head, almost similar to yeah. He's just higher with a whole lot more um, wrist extension there. Correct, and and you can kind of see how my back is kind of is that in extension? I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Yeah, golf nerds um, extended. You, you can actually see a little arch in the back. I mean, it's a big turn. You got a yellow shirt on. Yeah, you the wrinkles in the shirt. I mean, your hips. You you've allowed the hips to free up there as well. That's a big turn across your uh, pelvis area too correct correct I, um and so you know i i do this once in a blue moon where i ask people to send me their swing videos and i'll do a quick comment of, of what i think they should be working on right. and so much so much of the um of the problem is the lack of turn like i said and certain people really cock their wrist hard and it and it fakes the motion of them getting a big turn, which is a big problem. Like they they think they're getting enough turn because of all the of all the angle that their wrists have created, and it just doesn't set them up very well, in my opinion. So, and you know, a lot of people like a shorter swing because they feel that it's more accurate, um, and they kind of point to John Rahm or or Tony Fino, um, but they forget the fact that those guys are monsters Super basically yeah. they're they're if they did a full backswing they would hit it you know 190 miles per hour ball speed if they wanted to um and so yeah you know, i it just prevents them from getting a big turn which which what which i deem very important in the golf swing yeah and you're so right i mean listen you said it earlier wrist alignments I mean, your hands are your only connection with a club if you can isolate that area, your chance of controlling the club face, which talks to the golf ball, is more important or is the most important thing. Okay, final one here, and this is about change. And you start this tweet off with, I've given a lot of advice on here. While I do try to give advice that covers most amateur golfers, the advice could definitely make you worse. The most important thing, I think, is to try it for yourself. It doesn't work after a few, if it doesn't work after a few tries, throw it away. Absolutely. This goes for any advice you see, even if it's from Tiger or Jack or Hogan or whoever. The worst thing to do is assume it won't work for you now and then not even try it. Things might have changed since you last tried something. I've had that happen multiple times where it wasn't working in the past. 
but it worked great other times. Um, super insightful here about change. And on the tour, it's like everyone's got rabbit ears and radar eyes because you're looking at the guys who are playing the best all the time. And it's hard to stay in your lane. But then by the same token, you know, I advise people, I'm like, look, don't go try and take another man's, man's medicine. But that mustn't be, that doesn't mean you must, should be myopic and never look and try something because it might be that, that secret. So, so finish us off with this, with, with your observation, please. Yeah, it's tough. You know, like we've been talking about golf is so personal and, you know, I mentioned Jack and Tiger and Hogan and, you know, all these guys, you, there are similarities in what they talk about, but they also differ in, in a ton of different things in their swing or, or how they went about it. And, you know, even for me, I've had times where I've seen something on video where, where Tiger kind of explains how he chips and I've tried it out and, and, you know, I'm, I'm the same person trying this technique out, but, you know, mm -hmm. maybe like a year before it didn't work out, but now I try it and, and it works, you know, it works better for some reason. And, you know, there, and there are things that I've tried with the swing where I've tried to copy, you know, whether it's Victor or, or someone else's swing thoughts or, or how they, how they hit the ball. And, and it certainly hasn't worked. And, you know, I just kind of that response is along a lot more because of the responses I get from my tweets on Twitter where everyone is so quick to kind of shut down, like, no, that, that doesn't work for me or that, that, no, you're wrong. That doesn't work. And while that might be true, it might not work for you that you should, there's no way that you should just shut it down so simply like that. And, you know, I, I just hope that, from my advice or any, any advice you see on, on, on social media or, or your coaches or, or whoever, you should certainly give it a try. I mean, there's, there's, you can't, you can't get much worse um, just by trying it. And whether if it doesn't work, then absolutely throw it away and, and um, don't, don't try it. Um, but certainly no, no hurting and giving a go on the range. It reminds me of two things. First, Martin Hall quote. It was made. Both these observations have been made on this very podcast. Um, not this one, previous ones. Martin Hall. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll keep getting what you've been getting. And then you've talked about Victor Hovland a bunch. He was on here a little ways ago. And he, the, the takeaway from Victor for me was he just kept on talking about being open-minded. And he's like, when I went to college, I was open-minded. Now I knew how who I was. So I didn't follow blindly, but I was always prepared to listen. And look, it's worked out nicely for him. It begs the question from me to you. So you try things. Do you keep notes or journal on what you do? So sort of give impressions, thoughts, you know, reminders, because we all tend to want to forget when things are going wrong. Definitely. Um, I've in the past, I've kept um, notes, kind of swing thoughts here and there or um not just full swing, but, but short game stuff. And mm -hmm. um, even pros like me look up stuff on YouTube of like, Oh, maybe like see how, how that guy does it. And you know, the algorithm usually spits out something else from another <laughs> guy. And so, you know, you can get definitely rabbit get hole. into the rabbit hole, <laughs> rabbit hole of, of, of golf um, instruction out there. Uh, we, we, you know, Pros are not that different than than regular amateurs when it comes to that stuff. Well, we're all we're all at the end of the day, we're all just trying to get better. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I feel like the YouTube algorithm certainly uh, keeps me up to date with with all all the different kinds of stuff. And and you know, I'll see something. I'll be like, oh, you know, I haven't tried that in a while. Uh, maybe I'll try that tomorrow. Stuff like that. <laughs> You're such a giver. I appreciate you sharing not just your time, but all these insights. Um, Again, folks, it's like a, a Michael Kim journey, uh, journey and, and and journal on on golf improvement. So thank you, Michael. Um, please share with the folks where they can find you. Uh, if there's a website, social media, and stuff, so they can follow you. Uh, no, like uh, Mark said, um, check out my my Twitter. It's where I'm most active, and I, I actually got rid of my Instagram a couple years ago. So that's that's uh, basically the only place you'll be able to find it. Very few spots on Twitter or X folks that is 
uplifting or are uplifting. Michael Kim's feed certainly is, so give him a follow. Hey, Michael, thanks for joining us. I so appreciate you. Enjoy the time off, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Sounds good. You too, Mark. <laughs>